Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Adobe Live. I'm very excited about today's topic. We're going to talk about YouTube channels. And with me today is Joe Allen. Hi, Joe. Yo, what's up? Uh, we changed roles today. Yeah, we are flipping the sandwich uh, exactly. back and forth, hosting and guesting and guesting and hosting. Exactly. And we talk, we're going to talk about everything YouTube, how to set up a channel, what it takes to maintain a channel, how to find success on YouTube, because I like to say you did all these things. You have a very successful YouTube channel, so you're the exactly right person to answer all the questions we have about YouTube. I hope so. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, I've been, uh, I've been running my YouTube channel for uh, coming up, quick bit of maths, coming up seven years this year. Wow. end of this year um so yeah there's uh, there's been a lot that i've learned along the way and I, I feel like i've taken a slightly different approach to what other youtubers uh have done and other creators in in sort of similar fields and mm -hmm. for many parts i feel like it's it's been a good benefit on me personally and uh it's made a lot of business sense so hopefully i can sort of divulge some of that information and um i'm hoping that there are people in the chat who are also interested in um YouTube channels, maybe you're thinking of starting one or, or whatever. So hopefully we can get into that. Exactly. So if you're watching on YouTube, come over to Behance. We have a chat on Behance where you can ask questions. And I'm just going to say hi quickly to everyone in the chat. We have Jackie, Oliver, Christy, Andreas, Cameron, Gareth. Hello, everyone. Feel free to ask any questions. We already have some written down, so we cover all the basics, but feel free to just drop them in the chat and I will read through them and ask Joe as we go along. But I think we have an intro to your YouTube channel so we can get a bit of a feel what you do. And I think if everything works, um, Tim can show us your trailer. There we go. That is me. <laughs> that is you. In a, so... in a nutshell, it's essentially... Uh, <laughs> sorry, I just kind of like took over on that. Uh, in a nutshell, it's essentially uh, videos about uh, filmmaking and photography uh, whilst traveling the world in a uh, <clears throat> normal year. <laughs> yeah, um, not in a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, yeah. It's, uh, it's been... Uh, it's been a, a great sort of ride and journey over the years and um, mm -hmm. looking back over over old videos and stuff the uh, for me I just feel like I've kind of become more and more comfortable and um, just the quality has grown on various things um, yeah. but yeah we can uh, we can get into some of the details with uh, we, some of your questions and whatever exactly I'm sure we will we will try to um, go through the process of starting maintaining and then finding success so i think we will start right off with um one of the questions that i guess people ask themselves um when they think about youtube or starting a channel um and the first question we came up with was why would you do like start a youtube channel what are the motivations behind it um, maybe what was your motivation to start a YouTube channel to just give some inspiration to other people? Um, that would be the first thing we want to cover. Yeah, it's um, well, yeah, it's it's kind of like a, a key question, really, of why have a, a mm. channel, really. Um, it's I'll admit it's not for everyone. Um, there's a, a hell of a lot of work involved in it, and before I started my channel, um, I had spent a long time watching other creators. 
uh, there was kind of a, a big boom of YouTube channels around 2011 uh, to mm -hmm. 2014 or so. Um, and I potentially joined at the end of that sort of early boom, I guess. And then there's been later ones since. Um, but one of the key reasons for me is I uh, have been doing photography for a long time, like 17 years or so. Um, and I wanted to get into filmmaking and I wanted to learn more about video with um, DSLRs and, and go down that route. And of course, the best way to learn things is to create things in quantity. So I started my YouTube channel as a way to get to know my camera for video and just to put video out and just learn about all the ins and outs of what I was doing. Uh, I didn't really know what direction it was going to go down. I I knew that I just wanted to to make videos and experiment and I always had a, an interest and passion in it. Back in my early young days, I used to make uh, videos on camcorders with mini DV, do like stop mm -hmm. motion, all sorts with these mini figurines. Um, but there was a, a massive gap where I just didn't make videos because I didn't have a camera that could do video. Um, second to that, uh, at the time I was uh, freelancing in my design work. So I'd, uh, actually no, was I freelancing? No, I wasn't, I was full time. Um, so I was a full time designer and I was just going kind of stir crazy. I was just bored throughout the day. Um, I was just losing my mind on the amount of um, distractions I had on things that I wanted to do outside of design work. So I was very productive in what I was doing during the day, but as soon as it came to the evening, that was when I just couldn't stop working. I would get into a flow state almost immediately and every night, every evening, I'd be working on other design things, trying to build up my blog, uh, doing photography stuff in the evenings and weekends, just any excuse to go and do something creative. And uh, I decided that I was going to go freelance in my design work and try and build a business doing creative work for other clients. And at the same time, I would start my YouTube channel and hopefully start to get more commercial photography work. Um, mm -hmm. Everything up until that point had all been design. So by putting my photography work and sharing behind the scenes of making my photos and going on um, little excursions around London or whatever, uh, hopefully, I would get hired for some photography work and it, it started to work. I started to get hired for things. Um, people would recognize me um, for the videos that I was doing and then go and do some extra photography work and some client things. And my design work started to kind of come down a bit and my photography work went up. Mm -hmm. but then what happened is the YouTube channel just kept on growing in the middle of it all. And um, many years later and after uh, dedicating a lot of time to travel, I've now made it a full-time business with other things now happening around the YouTube channel as a main sort of focus. So commercial work that I do on the side um, is exactly that. It's on the side. The YouTube channel is kind of the, the main sort of focus. So your motivation or your why you started your YouTube channel was basically, first of all, just to explore and then to further your photography career? Is this yeah, pretty much. It was, um, yeah. it was a, a self-learning um, process yeah. of I'll, I want to learn more about a camera and yeah. I want to get hired once I've learned what I'm doing with it <laughs> and yeah. it, it's kind of it's kind of worked in that way and, and paid off um, yeah definitely and one question that I have about that is when you started your channel did you have any one that you looked up to where you like I want to do stuff that that person is doing so a yeah. role model if we want to definitely be as um, big as that so I was one of the early subscribers to Chase Jarvis uh, back in, I want to say 2008, 2009 at least. Um, and Chase has obviously gone on to become one of the um, most well-known photographers and entrepreneurs around the world um, for a whole host of educational and just great creative work. But it, his uh, sort of reach out to me was via his YouTube channel. And I saw his channels, I saw his videos, loved them, fell in love with the idea of becoming a commercial photographer. And I just, I don't know, I, I really love that behind the scenes aspect. It was so um, just intriguing to see that. Um, and yeah. it, it took a long time until I eventually started making videos in a similar sort of narrative, I guess. But yeah, he was absolutely a, a big focus. Um, and then of course there were huge uh, daily vlogging channels um, around the time, Ben Brown, Fun for Louis, um, yeah, people of that nature who were inspiring that travel itch that I had. Yeah. 
So we've been talking about you started your channel seven years ago, and we all know in the early ages of YouTube, um, it was maybe a bit, or people think it might have been a bit easier because the platform wasn't as crowded as it is now. So that leads us already to our second question. Is it still worth it starting a channel now? Because people might think, oh, there's so much content out there already. How am I ever going to stand out? Is it even possible now to to find success? But that's later. But is it still worth it, do you think? Yeah, that's it's a fair question. Um, I, I mean, I can cut to the chase and say yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but there's there's definitely a lot to think about it in um as you said it, it's a very competitive market it's it's been a competitive market from the get-go really but uh where things have maybe shifted if you were to think of it as a business um idea so for example you may already have a business and you think you know what we want to be more more visible on the internet with um various bits of content and youtube by far Uh, for me anyway, has been the best place to put my work. Um, so even though I'm posting photography, posting it on YouTube has, has a much bigger response than what I ever had posting it anywhere else. Um, so YouTube has grown, but so has the audience. People are on the platform. They know what it means to subscribe to accounts. Um, you don't really need to explain that to people anymore. It's It was one mm -hmm. of those things where people didn't get what YouTube was and they would quite often use YouTube as a search engine and and that would be it and they'd go and search your username if they even remembered it but nowadays people remember what it is and they know to subscribe and they know what it is about having a profile um, but likewise uh, on a business sense if you were to be monetizing your content uh, because it is a more known sort of um, industry now there are more mm -hmm. companies who are willing to get involved with it and willing to pay for it whereas in the earlier days Yes, you maybe had less competition around uh, so many creators, but brands didn't really get it. They weren't really interested. So you were kind of still a, a lone cowboy in it, really. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's come up in waves and whatever. Um, but the the main thing that is always going to stick through is the integrity and just um, being yourself, really, which sounds as cliche as it is. But when it comes to YouTube, there is no one, man, this is going to be a tagline. When it comes to YouTube, There was no one but you who was on that tube, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> We can make an advertisement for YouTube where you say that. Um, yeah, and also Sandrine already said it's it's a lot of work to do it, and we're gonna get into that later because I also think now people understand a bit more what it takes to make a good video and how much work goes into that in order to stand out, maybe, and also to maintain um, a good YouTube channel that people want to come back to. So. Now, if we go to the next step and someone wants to join YouTube, decided it's still worth it in 2021 after listening to you and this watching the stream. Um, then the next question is what kind of creators, like what kind of creator do you want to be? What would you tell people that are like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know what I'm supposed to be showing on YouTube. Is there anything specific niche that is successful? Should I just be me and just show what I do or any advice on that? Yeah, I think um, to kind of go back on the on the last point of being you is is absolutely the best direction to take. Um, and being you means many things. Like I can I can look back on my old videos and and think, who is that? That is not me. I knew at the time that didn't feel like me um, because as soon as you put a camera in front of your face, it saps off about 20% of enthusiasm. Um, it reduces like it reduces you down to all of your anxieties about everything so it's very hard to be yourself on camera so when i say being you what i mean is uh think of what your passions are what your sort of key values in various things are and it could be broad it could be something like photography or it could be way more niche um another passion of mine is cable management i could probably create a channel about cable management and be endlessly happy creating content about cable management For many years um and that sort of uh that direct connection into you personally is what drives mm -hmm. the channel as long as you are continually making um videos that you are happy about you will continue to be happy about the channel and the audience will see that and it will work uh, but the main sort of takeaway i take from it is when i make videos i make them for me first i always think of is this a video that i personally would want to watch 
If it's not something that I wouldn't watch, then how can I expect someone else to watch it and believe me for making it? Um, so if it's something, you know, even when it comes down to a tutorial, if it's something that I think I would search for, or I know that I've searched for in the past and I never really came across the information delivered concisely or uh, it's probably the wrong word for me because I'm terrible at being concise. Um, but if someone never delivered it to a understanding that made sense, um, then I'd potentially see that as an opportunity to make that video in my own style um, because it's something that I would have watched. And I think that's really key because you do see channels and they're making stuff and you think, do you really believe this yourself? Um, you know, what's what's the agenda here? Um, and I think that idea of being you, or rather me being me, is what has helped me to have never burnt out. Um, you hear that a lot with creators where they, they just go too far too much and they run out they just run out of creative energy and it takes a lot of work to to build that um build that back up and, and to get yourself to a good uh level of things yeah i completely understand what you mean by create stuff that you want to watch yourself because i think a lot of people especially now also with social media get a bit hung up on what should i create that other people want to watch like thinking too much out of the perspective of my audience but you built your audience and like i think it's more important to think from yourself and then going towards your audience like if you will build the audience that will enjoy your content if you generate um authentic content and not building like just producing for an audience that is not reflecting your interests um because i think a lot of people think they have to fit into a niche for example only doing tutorials but even though it might not be what they're really passionate about and you can see it i think in the quality of videos as well you can see it in the passion of the person talking so i completely understand and i think it's really coming through on your videos and i'm waiting for more cable tidying videos so you can help me with my stuff that i <laughs> send you photos of and that gives you nightmares yeah it's um the uh, the cable management is actually a, a funny point is um sometimes you can get so lost in what you are interested in and, and what you think and um, you forget that you yourself isn't always the same you that's on the internet it can be the same to an extent but you forget that there's actually a lot of you that you haven't ever shared and this is one of the big realizations I've been making very recently in the last few weeks or so I've been heavily analyzing a lot of my videos and going through a lot of data that I've captured over the last few years and um just seeing where various different topics and things have maybe not quite missed the mark or they, they've missed the mark on on what I thought the audience would have had an interest in. And you piece it back and you think, well, of course they've got no interest in it. I've never expressed that I had a big interest in it. I knew that I did, but I never said it online. And uh, that's been a, a huge learning curve of realizing that although I am as authentic as I can be for myself online, there's still a lot that I'm quite reserved about. And realizing mm -hmm. where those gaps are that I need to sort of fill in and share. Um, and the cable management is actually a, a thing that's kind of been a, a bit of a running theme, uh, but got lost for a few years. And uh, I've started talking about it again because I've gotten response back from people who are also interested in it and they love the tidy setup. And um, even talking with clients about various products and they say, yeah, I saw your desk video. Um, that headphone cable under the desk, brilliant, love it. Yeah. I and, just uh, want to... Hey, the headphone cable under the desk is also the one thing that stood out for me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's little things like that that um, I mean, I call them the little big details. They're they're just these um these little things that make a big difference to me. And I've only sort of I have to consciously remember that oh, th this is probably something worth sharing. Um, and it's that shareability that helps build uh, I guess like successful content and whatever. But um. Yeah, as much as I, I have a close connection with the audience, uh, there's a lot that I've realized that I've held back on and I need to I need to do more um, to kind of develop that connection even further. Because whenever I've done meetups, um, hanging out with people, it's just amazing. You meet the, the actual faces of the people who are subscribed to your channel and have been for years. Uh, and then you realize you've got even more in common and they would never know because I hadn't shared it. So um, that's something I definitely need to work on. Yeah. So basically the advice for people would be find what interests you and what excites you and build your content around that rather than trying to fit into a trend or 
coming up with one certain niche and then trying to stick with that niche because I guess it's also interesting for people to see development, your interests change, maybe your channel's gonna change with you, um, which is totally fine. Um, but I guess that's a good advice for people just to find what interests themselves. Just uh, just noticing in the chat, there's a lot of love for um, for cable ties and cable yeah, management. Tidy desk. Yeah, everyone's Team tidy. going <laughs> going crazy of your tidy desk video. I mean, maybe Tim can put it in the chat if someone hasn't seen it yet, because it's um, for everyone that also wants their cables to be invisible. I think that was the goal most of the time. Yeah, um, you should absolutely check that out. Um, so and also going from tidy desk and cables, it's a very good segue for the next question is, is gear important? What do you need to make a good YouTube channel slash video? Do you think because I guess it's the same with photography, people always want to know what camera are you using? What gear do I need? And is it important or is it more about the content and then the gear isn't as important? What's your take on that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's one of these like double caveated questions um, because of mm -hmm. course gear is important um, in some ways and in many ways gear absolutely isn't important. It makes no difference. So it's important in the sense of you do need a camera to start um, or at least an audio device, because you can always just put an image up and just talk um, and have audio on a video. But um, having a camera is a, is a good place to start. Uh, smartphones, thankfully, have gotten so good in the last few years. Um, the video quality, I use iPhone footage quite heavily in my videos. I just dot them in and out and um, it fits in pretty seamlessly with my other cameras and things. So. In a pinch, if I'm, say, uh, on a trip somewhere and it comes to the evening and, and I'm just tired of carrying cameras around and, and all sorts, I may just go and do the rest of the evening with just my iPhone. And if there's anything I want to capture, I can do it with that. Uh, likewise, I have made full vlogs using iPhone. Um, there is a bit of a mess when it comes to the file management side of things, which is why I think a dedicated camera still works because you've got memory cards and you can you can be very intentional in where your memory cards go. Um, but having the top end cameras, yes, it can improve your work and it can improve the quality and things, but it is worthless if your narrative isn't there, if the actual content isn't there, if you being comfortable in front of the camera isn't there. Um, so it's double caveated in the sense of the gear doesn't matter until it does. So I think of gear as being, uh, you have certain ceilings to your quality. And once you've mastered a camera and you've gotten to know what you can juice out of that camera as much as you can, then there's a time where you can look to something better that maybe doesn't make your content better. It just makes it easier for you to work with. Um, so, for example, getting a cine camera, something that's been a dream of mine for ages, and I've only recently just got one. And I'm still trying to toy with the idea of, you know, how is this going to fit in? I'm already in love with the camera and there's a lot of features that have made things significantly easier straight away. But if I'd have got it a few years ago, I wouldn't have really known quite how it would have fitted in properly. Um, so it, it's reaching those limits and levels. And um, if you're going to invest anything, uh, it would be audio quality and lighting, I'd say. Um, and lighting isn't necessarily about getting a, you know, a good artificial light, but it's just paying attention to the natural light uh, and working with that. doesn't really matter what camera you're using, as long as you've lit it well, it will raise the quality tremendously. Yeah, because that would have been my next question, just to put the gun to your head and be like, what would you say someone needs? Like if I tell you, I want to start my YouTube channel next week, I don't have any gear and I want to do vlogs, what do you say I would have to get? Uh, there's a chance you've probably already got a smartphone that's of substantial value. I'd say anything that came out in the last um, five years or so will actually be sufficient for uh, the majority of audiences. They they may not even really notice too much. Uh, of course, any camera can work. It's just you are going to attract some attention of people saying, <laughs> what was this filmed on? But if the message is right, then it's, it's going to be good. Um, and even with that, using something like the earphones that come with um, 
come with your phone, if they've got a microphone on, that microphone is likely going to be so much better than uh, if you were holding the phone out and using the microphone back to you, simply because it's closer. The closer you can get that microphone to the source, the better the quality is going to be pretty much. And um, just a clear audio narrative goes so far. You can have a crummy picture, but if the audio is great, people can still watch and, uh, and can still enjoy. Yeah. I guess so too. I think people are very forgiving if the content is interesting and engaging. So um, I also think um, it's not, a, you can't make a story interesting by expensive gear. Absolutely. You can, yeah. You, you, you kind of forget how, how forgiving people can be. It's, um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely because the right word. We, spend time on Zoom. we are used to bad audio and pixely images at yep. this point probably. <laughs> Okay, that goes into, I'm like just going through the questions and the process. Um, so now the, we have our gear, we know what we want to do on YouTube. Now the question that I also have, and I know it's going to probably be, it's not, there's not one answer to this question, but how long does it take to make a video? How much work goes into a good YouTube video? Because the intention behind that question for me was, I don't think people understand how much work it is and how much time goes into producing something like that because it's not just setting up the camera it's planning um it's going to the location it's editing publishing all these things that go into it what would you say it takes from like the idea being born in your head to clicking published on youtube mm -hmm. it's long <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's very long <laughs> um uh so in in answering this i don't want to come across as a way that um puts people off uh it's more a case of you can of course publish a video you could you could record a video live and just let it sit there on the internet afterwards and and it took as long as and you would like for right now. <laughs> exactly um so you know and even with that you can get clever with various bits of equipment and switch cameras and all sorts to make it look like it was edited and if you're concise with things it works well um but the the more seriously you take things of course the longer things do take um and there is also again there's a balance between things um there's what's that famous quote is um what's better than perfect is published something like that so you can always <laughs> hold yourself to never publishing anything if it's not completely perfect but again there is a time when you when you know you can edit something and you probably should edit something so you'll do it um, but if you're unsure of it, you can always just leave that for the next video and you can just slowly progress. Uh, you'll never get perfection immediately. But in terms of how long it actually takes, uh, some of my videos um, have taken like an absurdly long time that I almost don't want to admit because they're fairly straightforward videos and it's where I've maybe not been sure of um, how I wanted my narrative to run and I'm like changing direction or I'm keeping things in my timeline as backup and I think do I want that a little bit later I'm not sure so I keep it there and then it just it clouds everything and doesn't make it clear um, but as a rough estimate for a typical uh, vlog on my channel so say something like uh, I think if my screen is on um, so something mm -hmm. like this video which was uh, going through uh, various areas of London, taking photos of my camera and I show the images on the screen and there's always time that's required for editing the photos, uh, time that's required for editing the video, piecing it all together. This is a, a 16 minute video by the end point and that took maybe three or four days to edit I'd say um, of maybe about six seven hours per day or so and yeah, there's so much that went into behind the scenes on that. And that's a fairly informal video uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, one of the areas that I'm really trying to work on better for this year is planning more upfront so that mm -hmm. I can have a better image of what the final outcome will be so that I don't have those cloudy judgments later on of, is this the narrative I want to take? Or, uh, or even just knowing how I'm going to title the video. That's one thing that I'm terrible at. I'm far too honest and far too boring in my titles. <laughs> I, I need to do something. Yeah, I need to do something that just is a little bit more like a headline where it's still honest and it tells the story, but it, it has that element of intrigue 
um, I, I think I struggle with that a lot. Also, Sandrine said, and I think that's also what you meant. Done is better than good, or like done is better than perfect. Yeah, to that's like probably it. Yeah, put it out there before you rethink it for the one hundredth time, because you're only gonna make it. I think for me, it's like I'm only making it worse at some point mm -hmm. if I don't yeah. just leave things at a certain point. Um, so I guess. Like I expected, the answer can be, it can be rather quick if you want like something that is live streamed or it's just talking head, maybe people just tell a story on, on YouTube. But obviously if you want a full vlog with B-roll and storytelling and a concept behind it, that takes a lot of time and editing takes a lot of time. And I guess also if people start out with a YouTube channel, learning how to edit. And learning how to conceptualize a video that's also something that takes time but it's worth it yeah it's um that in itself is a is a growing um parallax where you you get faster editing but you get more ambitious and so <laughs> you spend the same amount of time editing often even more but the quality gets better um yeah, yeah that's that's definitely something to contend with and so as the last step of building a YouTube channel, is there anything before we go deep dive into running and succeeding on YouTube? Is there anything you think people have to keep in mind? Any secret tips, anything you wish someone would have told you before you went in your YouTube adventure? Um, I think I think probably, yeah, one of the one of the biggest things that I'm I'm only doing now, like seven years on, is to really sort of take stock of knowing um, what it is that you've put out on the internet. And I think for a lot of people, um, we are quite reserved in our own sort of ways. We we don't want to share too much stuff. You know, we all see that too often where people have overshared things and it just um, comes back and haunts them. And it's you know, they've maybe created a, a narrative on their channel about a particular topic, such as cable management. And it turns out that they actually didn't really want to create a channel about cable management. Um, but, you know, here we are, that's what they've got. So I think taking stock on what your um, what you've put out uh, in terms of like your personality traits, the things that your close friends know you for, and just really mm -hmm. notice, have you actually shared that online? Um, because there's a difference between being, you can of course be authentic in it, but if you recognize that there's authenticity and uh, quantity in various things, um, that I think can be really valuable. And some of the channels that I look at and I sort of admire and, and watch frequently, I do feel like I've got a, a very good sense of the person. But now I do mm -hmm. question, I think, how much more do I not know? How much more do they have to share? Um, and essentially, how how much more entertainment value or quality value um, gets lost on the editing floor because of poor planning or um, all these areas that, you know, there's time is of the essence and you just have to be concise in getting your message across. And sometimes that means you cut various things that probably would have been valuable to people. Um, right. So yeah, that's, that's kind of a a key thing I'd get I'd say but I think that's also maybe what makes people come back to a channel if they think maybe there's more I'm interested to see what's to come what else this person has to say so I don't even think it's always a bad thing I think it can be a rather good thing to yeah there's there's definitely value in that um I guess maybe maybe one of the things that I'm I'm sort of thinking uh of myself on stuff is I I quite often I love to work on like really technical things and I love to go through the process of uh, piecing something together technical. But quite often I don't bring people along for the journey. I only show them the finished product. And so what happens is I just, um, I kind of display everything, but I didn't tell anyone that I was working on it. So where I'm really excited for it and the people that are close to me personally, they're excited for it because they were involved and they've seen all the work and the process that went into it. The audience, there are some who will read between the lines and they'll see everything. But for the most part, when you just put something out on the internet, it's contending with so much other stuff. And if they haven't been brought along for the journey, 
they don't have that same excitement. And it's heartbreaking at times because you think like, oh, I, I thought you were going to love this. Um, mm. But at the same time, how would they know? Because I didn't share the journey. So yeah, yeah sharing the journey, I, I think, is a, is a real um, key thing and message to, to continue to sort of propagate. That's a, that's a really good tip because I experienced a little bit um, something similar where I started sharing my behind the scenes of photo shoots, which funny enough makes people more excited to see the final photo. I exactly. feel like it changes how they view the photo because you take them along the journey of making it. So I do understand if people understand what are you doing and how you create what you do and then they see the final product, they're even more excited about the final product. So I understand that. And there's a question a little bit that goes in the same direction from Cameron. And Cameron asks, do you edit your photos for the videos before you start editing the video or at the same time when you have uh, photos in your videos? I've, I've experimented all different ways on this. Um, I've tried uh, thinking of it video first and then go, go through the video and, and see what the, the narrative is. Um, and then looking through my photos and marking which ones I want to edit and which ones fit well to the video. Because uh, sometimes I'll edit photos, but they don't even go into the video. Uh, in fact, that happens frequently because there's just no natural way to fit. And if it's, unless it's an image that I'm really pleased with, um, it actually throws off the viewer. But there are times where I've got an image that I really love, but I got no footage around it. And so I'll just throw it in the video because I think it's an image that's worth seeing, but there's no context to it. Um, and it generally works. Um, I've also tried with editing all the photos first so that I see or I build up an idea of what the visual narrative is through the stills and then create a video that goes around it. Uh, and I've tried doing it in between and generally doing it in between is the worst idea because it's the most unproductive. You're chopping and changing between applications, you're changing your, your mindset and your skill set into different things and it's just it doesn't work very well. Um, so yeah, I think the the better approach for me is probably doing video first mm -hmm. and then um, looking at the photos and editing those and, and dropping those in. Uh, but I've created a lot of um, sort of efficient setups in my timelines that make it super easy to drop in images and uh, I can just do it very quickly at the end. Um, and it sort of works well to cover bad edits and bad cuts um, mm -hmm. to cut different audio bits together you can cover the visuals with a photo um, and yeah it allows me to be a little bit more ruthless with my video because I know that I can probably cover it with photos yeah that makes sense Gareth said YouTubing YouTubing I like that verb YouTubing is a job in itself there's a lot to do and I think 100% and I guess a lot of people don't know how much goes into it but one part that I also think a lot of people don't know that much about or are a bit scared because it involves numbers is the analytics that go into a YouTube account and, and how you read them, I guess, or how you understand them, how you work with them for your most benefit. I guess mm. that's the next thing we're going to talk about, right? Yeah, so the, it, as you said, like... YouTube is a job in itself. Um, I'd go as far as saying it could even be five jobs in itself because you are um, you're the creator, you're the talent on screen, you're the producer, the editor, you're doing marketing, you're doing sales, uh, mm -hmm. logistics of things. Um, you are a project manager connecting with clients and companies and managing all of these things. And Unless you've come from a background, uh, which is where I feel fortunate in that I studied design, I worked in advertising agencies, I've worked for big corporations doing design work, and I've, I've had that sort of agency and big hands-on approach. But for a lot of people on a YouTube channel, they don't have the luxury of that background. So they're having to jump in and just do. Um, and mistakes will be made. And you know, maybe people don't have the, the long-term sight, uh, not knowing where things will become easier in the future or what they're doing now could be improved so much more. Um, so yeah, multiple jobs in one. Um, and at the end of it, all you see is maybe a 10 minute video and skip off. So I think it, it's those reasons and the, the channels that are successful are because of so much passion that goes in. It's despite all of those requirements, people still want to make videos. 
um, and people still enjoy watching them. Even when, you know, analytics and everything are trending downwards, the enjoyment of making a video and making something is what keeps it going. Um, so yeah, when it comes to analytics, the, the key metrics for YouTube is, uh, and for a long time, it hasn't actually been views. Uh, it's not actually about the view count at all. It's all about how long someone watches for. And that can be interpreted as a percentage. Uh, so for example, if you've got a 10 minute video and people watch average of five minutes, that's got a 50% audience retention rate. But no longer is it just on the video itself, but it's also on the session time on YouTube. So if you bring someone to YouTube as a platform, uh, whether that's through an external link or an email or something like that, um, or even just someone choosing to watch your video on YouTube, every video that they watch afterwards then gets subsequently added into this um, session time. Now, we don't get access to see what session time is that people are, are sticking around for, um, but even if they go off and watch other channels and other videos, that session time gets attributed to you as you made a valuable video that kept people on the platform that of course kept watching ads that made YouTube money and that has driven it. Um, so whether that's a video that's maybe created insight or intrigue into a particular topic that people have then clicked on other videos, uh, or maybe yeah. it's, maybe you didn't answer any of the questions and someone comes away from your video with more questions than they had answers. And um, yeah, keeping people on the platform of YouTube is a huge success to it. Um, and likewise, the the longer sort of watch time, it just shows that there's value. People are interested in this video. Um, and if you can maintain that interest throughout a, value, uh, throughout a video, then there's going to be value throughout there. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that's probably the, question, the key analytic. The question about analytics I have is, should you... Um, maybe that's maybe I'm wording it wrong, but should you listen to them? Do you know what I mean? Like, should you change what you're doing because you see analytics, or should you just stick with what you do, even if there's maybe some some downfall at some point? Because I think I sometimes struggle with should I just listen to the numbers and then adapt to that, or should I just keep going and hope for the best? Um, definitely listen to the numbers but recognize that they are always with uh, a grain of salt in in many ways um so i'm i'm such a data nerd i love going through the numbers i've got many spreadsheets analyzing various things i've even created scripts in google sheets that automatically pull the analytics data um, so that i can then analyze them in my own visual interpretation uh, and in terms of changing things for the analytics there is a fine line between where do you go too far? Uh, and for the most part, it's usually just little tweaks. Um, so for example, uh, a key thing that I've kind of learned with a lot of my recent analysis is when do you upload? That's, you know, what day of the week, what time? It's something that you have to be posting a lot to be able to um, compare and to, to have, you know, A-B testing. And as it turns out, I've not really been posting as much as I used to because my editing time has gone up, the quality I think has gone up and there's there's so much more intention to it, but it means that I have less chance to do those A-B tests on, do I upload on a Sunday? Do I try a Friday? Do I try whatever? Um, for the most part, it doesn't really matter all too much, but I have seen a, a big trend over say 100 videos that I've analyzed and earlier in the week, for my channel anyway, seems to have performed so much better. And then to try and create like a, a psychological thought behind it, it's this idea of um, everyone during their, their working week, they have uh, like a cache. They have this memory of what started on the Monday and then they think like, yep, yeah, that came in Monday. I'm going to try and watch that by the end of the week. And you remember it and then you maybe go back and watch it. And it gets to the weekend, something gets published and um, you maybe watch it or whatever. But if you don't watch it when it's published on the weekend, which is I typically used to post a lot on Saturdays and Sundays, as soon as it comes to Monday, people have cleared their minds and they've forgotten anything that happened last week. And so I feel like that is potentially a human behavior that also translates into the analytics. And I probably couldn't have read that from the data itself. I've had to interpret it and understand it. And I could still be wildly wrong about that. But going forward, it's given me this thought that I 
statistically have had videos that have had far better engagement and just response and have led to more business opportunities, um, they were published in the first half of the week. So that's an idea uh, to think of. But I that wouldn't have fun. known that if I didn't have had if I didn't have the quantity of videos to analyze and look back over. True. True. And that also is such a good transition into the next question. And that is, what do you need to know about uploads? Like, how do you how often do you have to upload what day, which you basically already answered? But what do I have to keep in mind when it comes to um, having control over, for example, how many people watch my video or how should I upload it? Also the question, how long should my video be? Maybe mm. is there anything where you feel like people don't watch an hour long thing they want to watch, then split it into three videos, for example, and make it different parts or um, stuff like your experience on that. Yeah, it's... um. I mean, how long a video should be, I always argue that a video should be as long as it should be. Um, and it's just finding that knowledge of, well, how long should that be? You just go around in circles chasing your tail on it. Um, but essentially, if, if you watch a video and you feel comfortable in the length and a good uh, telltale sign of this is if you watch someone else watching your video and as much as you may have edited it and felt comfortable, as soon as you see someone else watching it, you know the parts where you feel like that's going on a bit too long or mm. Ooh, I cut that a bit awkwardly because you can just feel the energy from someone else watching your video. And um, that is a, a huge help of just having someone see it and watch over their shoulder. Um, the other thing to bear in mind with uploads is and YouTube kind of go sometimes for this argument and sometimes against it in their messaging. So it's, it's a little bit ambiguous, um, but how much is weighted on that first two days to a week of a video being published, especially if you have an audience. Um, because if you make a video that doesn't attract the audience's attention, so you've maybe given it a boring title or a thumbnail that doesn't make sense, but you know that video is great, those who watch it probably watch it and enjoy it and maybe create a great watch time. But there are so many people who would have enjoyed it, but they didn't click because it didn't look like it was a video for them or they've got other videos and you can't expect people to watch every video on your channel. Um, but there, there are ones where you're like, I know the majority of people would have loved that because I've done something similar that also is similar. Um, and if you miss the mark on those first two days or a week, it can have, uh, and I can look at my stats and prove this, but it can have a dramatic effect over the length of time for the video. And it's one of those things where you just never know. You're like, well, could it have reached more people and brought more you know value to other people um or maybe it wouldn't have you don't really know um but either way i i firmly believe that it's good intention to front load as much of your thought and preparation onto that initial time frame um and likewise even dedicating a day or more to market your video to actually promote it on instagram stories and twitter and Instagram posts and all these other things, they they take up hours and you don't realize it. So actually yeah. uploading and then from upload to publish, um, it takes more hours than I remember every single time I do it. But, you know, you just have to get with it and yeah. But that's basically, I don't know how we do it, but it's like once again, a perfect transition into the next thing. The question being, how do I build an audience and then engage with the audience because you said I have to market my video obviously to reach the people that are interested in it and how do I make sure that the people I think might enjoy my content actually see my content and know what it is about what do you think is the important bits like you already mentioned thumbnails titles descriptions marketing strategies how do I make sure my people like my people my audience <laughs> sees what I create yeah, the um, I think the the key thing that um, I've either been doing it subconsciously. I mean, I've obviously been able to have built a channel um, and have got an audience. But where I I kind of analyze back and I'm like, ah, oh, things could maybe have been differently. Um, is going back to sharing the journey, and mm. I think um, I mean I still read every single comment that comes into the channel unless it's in like a, a reply thread because I don't actually get notifications of those. Um, but every initial comment that comes onto the channel, I still read them. Uh, I still 
soak in the response from the audience. Unfortunately, I'm not able to respond to every comment, um, but I, I still get to get to understand and I, I put a good effort into engaging with as much audience as I can, especially in those early um, couple of days or so of a video, because there's also value in the fact of um, this is a two way street. It's a community of everyone. There's there are people who've come along for the ride and, and they enjoy and they talk about things. And there are people that I have become good friends with who were originally just viewers of the channel. And they've made me message and they've had a similar interest in cable management or whatever. And um, I've then gone through and, uh, you know, carried on chatting with them and become good friends over such a, a simple little thing. But it was all a spark of a connection. Um, and likewise, doing meetups and going on photo walks with people and becoming good friends with them because of that. And um, then seeing other channels of uh people who i originally met because they were viewers and they've gone on and started youtube channels and they're doing very successfully um and they are now publishing frequently that inspires me and it, it comes mm -hmm. full circle um because at the end of it is it, people are people it's just that's what draws people to things um it's the people on the other side of it and yeah it's it's a very authentic thing um you could game the system and you know go down a clickbaity route and you could probably build a channel incredibly fast, but you will lose all authenticity and the longevity of it is just not going to last. Um, so the best way to engage is to be as polite and kind as you are in person um, and carry it on that way. Being polite uh, is also, there's a question in the chat. How often do you get, um, they call it negative and nasty comments. Is there anything, would you react to those or do you think, um, or? I hope you don't get any, but even if you think of what could people do. I'm I'm very fortunate that I I get very few uh, negative comments. Um, mm -hmm. And if I do, then I I kind of have, uh, I actually did write down a, a checklist of things, um, but it's become like a, a mental note. And it's recognizing, for one thing, do they have an avatar? Is this an account that was just created mm -hmm. randomly? Um, on YouTube, it's a little bit hard to to gauge because a lot of people don't actually have avatars on their YouTube accounts. Um, is their comment uh, missing a particular point? In which case, is it my fault? Did I not deliver my point correctly? Because maybe I agree with their comment, but it's mm -hmm. maybe not what that video is about. Um, and they've maybe just said it in a rush. Is uh, English not their first language? Because sometimes when you write in something that's not your first language it comes out blunt and to the point um, and you may interpret it as negative but in actual fact they're just trying and you can't discount someone because of that um, all these various things uh, that you kind of like put through a filter that then leads you to decide should i answer this or are they just trying to get a response yeah. um, and sometimes you have your audience who jump in for you um, and they can, you know, give some extra things like, oh, um, like one example for it, uh, as a thought that just came to mind, as some people mentioning about the way that I say premium or the fact that I do say premium a lot because I, I enjoy premium things. I enjoy high quality stuff. And um, there were comments of like, who does this guy think he is like talking about premium? And <laughs> <laughs> then people in the comments are like, oh, that's just Joe. It's just how he talks. Like he, he just loves you know, premium quality stuff. Um, and that yeah. is just like a, a misinterpreted thing. But there are some some other nasty stuff. Um, one of the greatest things on YouTube is that you have the ability to hide a user's comments. So they can continue mm -hmm. shouting to the wall of the internet, but no one will ever see it. And I will never see it. Um, and it's a much better system than blocking. And I wish other yeah. social networks would create it because when you block someone, you know that you've got a response. Um, from their perspective, they know that they've triggered you. But if you hide them, they don't know. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. And just because I want to jump to some of the questions that we have, because we have like roughly 10 more minutes. I wanted to, I know that's one question that you feel passionate about and have a good view on how to build stamina. Because I think a lot of people are excited to start a YouTube channel. They're motivated in the beginning. They um, published their first few videos, but I guess that goes to, goes in line with negative comments or bad numbers or like it just not being so easy and so much, you realize it's so much time 
and you're maybe a bit tired, like how do you build stamina? How you keep going? Yeah, it's um, I think it's it's recognizing the 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 sort of or having the foresight to look ahead and see can I be doing this every time? And as I've, mm -hmm. I've mentioned so many times, and I will continue to mention to share the journey that I am a efficiency warrior. I am always trying to reduce friction in various workflows and other things. And if I spot myself doing something that's tiring me out because I'm repeating myself, I will look at it from a stamina perspective of, well, I, I can't keep doing this because it's going to affect other areas. So I need to kind of nip it in the bud and just fix some sort of element of my workflow, whether that's the planning aspect, whether it's the filming, whether it's other things related to a channel um, that allow all of this room for creativity. The eventual goal is to get as much as the workflow trimmed down as possible so that you've got all this space and headroom to just think creatively and to actually be in that space that made you want to start something in the first place and to keep it there. Um, and so there are times where that takes time and you can't upload to a weekly schedule that you've maybe mentioned about or you can't hold yourself to this arbitrary deadline that you've created. Um, and I've always taken an approach of being unapologetically on time, which is my way of saying it's ready when it's ready. Um, but also I don't necessarily want to have a channel where I'm going to come back and be like, oh, hey, sorry, I haven't uploaded this week. Um, and then go through a whole apology process because that just it sort of encourages that um, aspect of people then chasing you and asking, where's your next video? Where's your next video? You said you'd publish on this day um, because mm -hmm. you've made promises that you then break. So I, I very rarely make any sort of promise of when something's coming unless I absolutely know for sure that I can deliver on that promise. Um, and it has created, I think, a healthy relationship both with the audience and also with my own mental headspace. Um, because I'm not tearing my hair out over something that I've created as a problem for myself. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's a, a great sort of long-term way of thinking of things. But yeah, I think that's very inspiring because that also um, goes to how how to succeed doesn't necessarily just mean making money for me. Like it's success is also how you feel with what you're doing. Do you feel happy? Does it fulfill you? And then you're gonna keep doing it. So plan it and structure it in a way that is enjoyable for you. And if that's a weekly structure, like you publish every week the same day, that helps you create, then do that. If it doesn't, don't do it, but like uh, find your way to make it as enjoyable even in the long term, like think about what will make you enjoy this process even a year later after a lot of bumps in the road. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what does make uh, what makes a successful YouTube channel for you? If you want to sum it up real quick for us. Um, I think just following on that point, a, a successful channel is a channel with a happy creator and <laughs> the uh, the happiness that goes into making something and wanting to share it, if it's there just as much, if not more from when you started that channel, that is a successful channel um, because all else follows. Everything everything follows in terms of brand connections and monetization of things and working uh, on things because of who you are and what you've put out on the internet. If you're happy in that, it's so noticeable. It's just so apparently evident in every video. Um, and for the most part, the numbers don't really matter. They just help get you to certain points. But if you're not happy, what does it matter if you've got a million subscribers? Mm. That's true. I also have one question in the chat that I find really interesting. Sam is asking, how did your experience in Japan influence your creativity and your work attitude on your YouTube channel? Um, Japan was a, a big sort of turning point for me. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in Japan. My partner, uh, Japanese, and all her family are there, but born in London. Um, and having that connection, we've been able to really sort of build on that close sort of like community and family aspect, um, as well as the frequency of being able to visit. Um, and Japan just, it it touches all of my heartstrings on all of the things that I am passionate about. The premium stuff, the handcraft, <laughs> the quality of things, um, the dedication and the humbleness of uh, just wanting to share things and maintain the right sort of traditions, but at the same time be 
open, like they're simultaneously 100 years in the future and 100 years in the past. And mm -hmm. I just love that. There's, there's so much happening there. Um, and visually, it's just beautiful. So I feel so inspired when I'm in Japan. It's, it's the easiest place I find to make videos. Um, and that's definitely something I've, I've struggled a lot with over the last year of being in London, being in lockdown, and I just kind of discount it as well. It's not a normal year, so that's just what it is. Yeah. Okay, I just realized we almost reached a full hour. We had some more questions, but I just wanted to ask you, is there anything you feel like we've missed that needs to be said before we wrap up? Um, well, the, the thing with, with a YouTube channel is it's, um, it's a business really. And so trying to discuss in, in an hour, it's, um, it, it's always going to be endless. Um, so hopefully there's, there's some tidbits in there that are, are useful to discuss about. Um, but the biggest takeaway I would say is that if you are considering starting a YouTube channel or starting anything is to take time to watch other people doing it and to really analyze in yourself what is it about what you're watching that you're taking away from it are you enjoying their personality are you enjoying the skill that they're sharing are you enjoying the pacing of things the entertainment the distraction what is it that just draws you to that and is that something that you want to create and could you provide the same sort of feeling to other people in other words should it be shared um, yeah. that's what I did for me and um, it's, it's paid off dividends of yeah just self-checking when you're consuming something that's very good and if uh, anyone in the chat wants to maybe see a part two of this YouTube talk because I think we almost we covered like not even half of what we could have talked about so let us know in the chat if you want to see another YouTube video in the future and there's also a discord channel where you can continue the conversation and ask questions and yeah we've reached the full hour and i hope you learned a lot i have personally learned a lot so i really enjoyed this <laughs> thank you so much joe for another great stream and thank you sophia I hope, i hope you have a wonderful friday i hope everyone in the chat has a wonderful weekend and we will see you next week thank you so much guys thank you very much see you later